In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the very first verse of the Bible. And I think it's a good place to start in our study of how we got the Old Testament. Personally, I would prefer if we called it the first covenant rather than the Old Testament. I think a lot of Christians, for that matter, including the clergy, think that old is somehow bad. And uh, most people like new things, don't they? But without the Old Testament, the first covenant, the New Testament doesn't really mean much. And what's it all about? It's about creation. It's about the fall into sin. It's about God's redemptive promise of a Savior. It's all about God's grace. And all of this is repeated over and over again. The Old Testament is written by a number of men, inspired by God, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, um, who put it down on various forms. We, we think maybe some of the earliest pieces may have been on animal skins, but papyrus was certainly around by the time Moses was alive, and, and there was an alphabet by that time too. Um, and so it would have been recorded on paper, recopied and recopied and recopied um, until the most recent copy that we have is about 1000 AD. So scribes first, and what we call Masoretes, who were the successors to the scribes, would have meticulously recopied that text over and over again. The first writings of the Old Testament are dated around 1400 BC. The final book of the Old Testament, Malachi, was written about 400 BC. That's a thousand year period over the writing of the Old Testament in which it took place. How all this came about and how all these books were gathered into one place is probably as much a matter of conjecture as it is of history. Although we do know that by the time Jesus is on the scene, there are really two collections of Old Testament literature, although they didn't call it Old Testament at that time, they would have called it scriptural or biblical literature. And one would be the Septuagint, and the other would be the Hebrew Old Testament. What we have today with the collection of books that we have today is the same as the Hebrew Old Testament of Jesus' day. The Septuagint added uh, what's known as the apocryphal books, um, books that, that Protestants generally consider as helpful, but not inspired literature. Roman Catholics generally approach them as inspired but second level scripture. The Septuagint uh, has kind of an interesting history. Israel uh, was under the influence, well first of all conquered by Alexander the Great, and then Alexander the Great's method of conquering was to leave some of his retired generals behind to, to Hellenize or bring Greek culture to the area. And part of that Greek culture was Greek language. So even though the Romans are in, in, in power by the time Jesus comes on the scene, it's Greek culture and Greek language that sort of dominates the, the cultural and, and linguistic scene. So the Jews in, in their official language are, are speaking Greek, they're speaking Aramaic, they're reading Hebrew, they have a, they're, they're multilingual, but uh, Greek is, the, is the sort of the linguistic currency of the day. Besides that, there were some Jews scattered in Africa, northern Africa, Whose, whose everyday language was Greek. So there was a determination that the Hebrew Bible needed to be translated into Greek. The story goes, and this is pretty far-fetched, but the story goes that either 70 or 72 scholars were asked to uh, translate the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew scriptures, and uh, they did so, and when they came back together, they had translated it exactly the same way into Greek. That's pretty unlikely. Um, it's more likely that 70 scholars got together and came out with a product that was a collective product of the 70 scholars. Hence the name Septuagint, Septuagint meaning 70. Uh, it is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it was uh, in use, apparently a lot of the New Testament does quote from the Septuagint as opposed to the Hebrew scriptures. Here before me is a scroll that survived the Holocaust. It's from the western part of the Netherlands and it's over 225 years old. The oldest manuscript of the Old Testament that we have today is the Masoretic text from about 1006 AD. And one would think that with these number of years there's got to be a lot of transmission errors from the time of Christ to the present. That's what a lot of liberal scholars thought for many years. That was until one day and a shepherd boy walking along the, between the Dead Sea and the bluffs and pitches a rock, so the story goes, up into the caves up there and hears something breaking. 
and goes up the hill and discovers all these jars of pottery with scrolls in them. I don't think he knew what he had. It wasn't until these hit some antiquity dealers around Palestine that, that people figured out what they had. And what they had was a cache of some, many of the biblical texts that predated the Christian era by just a few years. And so you jumped a thousand years from the latest manuscript, now with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, you've jumped a thousand years back. Now the fascinating thing with that to me is you would expect that in a thousand years you would find a lot of differences in the text, that there would be a lot of scribal errors, that kind of thing, in transmitting the text. There are very few, very, very few, and the ones that are there aren't substantive. So, Joel, why did you bring me to this section of the great Arizona desert? Well, Dr. Meyer, it's a great question because really, this is the only place that I know and we have access to that closely resembles the topography of the northwestern corner of the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in a little community called Qumran. Now, what makes this area so unique is that it's very, very dry. Of course, the dry air would preserve the scrolls, That's too, the as important. they were sealed in those jars. You see what's so important in terms of analyzing biblical manuscripts is this common argument you hear that because the scribes had to transcribe them every one or two hundred years when the ordinary scrolls turned to, to crumbled and so on, they had to maybe occasionally make errors and then the errors were absolutely multiplied as they went through generation after generation of manuscripts. And, and so very often the biblical critics claim that uh, our Bible today may not even resemble what happened in terms of the original autographs as they're called 2,000 years ago. So this was the first time I think scholars had a chance to see how carefully biblical manuscripts were copied across a 1,200 year period. Because before this, as you pointed out, the Masoretic text from a little over 1,000 AD was the oldest surviving manuscript from the Old Testament. At Qumran, they discovered two scrolls of Isaiah that were 200 years old in Jesus' day. And you're 100% right. We even find even more remarkable things. For instance, there were 36 copies of Psalms found in the Dead Sea Scroll community, 21 copies of Isaiah. There were 30 copies of Deuteronomy, and yet all of the scribes there and all of the script that was found, and you do a side-by-side -side comparison of the 36 copies of Psalms, for example, Besides the occasional spelling error that wouldn't change doctrine at all or change the temperature of hell one degree to the left or the right, there are virtually zero scribal errors in the 36 copies of Psalms from the fragments that were put back together again. It's a remarkable thing. So now we have a way to test across 1,200 years of history how this manuscript tradition took place. And the similarities, and let's be more specific, the lack of maybe some errors was phenomenal, as you were just saying. They were so careful in their scribal. Yes, did they make some little notations on the side when, as you said, there were more than two columns of a mistake, but they were very, very, very careful. And the check and balance of the community there at Qumran was really world class for not having the technology that we know today, where you have spell check and where you have word counts and things like that, that we know at least uh, the accuracy and integrity is still there. I think it's very important because today, Islam, the greatest competitor to Christianity, claims that the Christian scriptures were ruined by manuscript errors so soon after it happened, and uh, the Holy Quran is the final revelation of God to correct all that. And there are some groups uh, today yet, like the Mormons, for example, who claim that the Book of Mormon now corrects all the errors made within 60 years. Give me a break right, right. Uh, in the New Testament. That's not true, and this is why the, the Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls are of fundamental importance. It's fascinating, it really is. You know, there may be one more reason why the Dead Sea Scrolls are of tremendous importance for Christians. Uh, the higher critics, the extreme biblical critics, uh, let's say in the last century, used to claim that the Gospel of John was written way into the second century. Uh, the Tübingen School in Germany, you recall, said that the Gospel of John was probably written around 175 A.D. and therefore forget any eyewitness testimony. 
But then, of course, the discovery of the Rylands papyrus right. uh, way up the Nile of between 100 and 110 shows that that was wrong. Right. But uh, the reason the critics objected to John being early was because the concept of light versus darkness, love versus hate, war versus peace, those were not Jewish concepts of the time. So one of the first discoveries made at Qumran was the scroll that said the war of the sons of light versus the sons of darkness. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that, that was one of my favorite ones too. And, and of course, you, there's so many interesting texts in there, whether it's the temple scroll or whether it is the famous copper scroll with the treasure map and all the other stuff. But it really is interesting that you bring up dating because if we look at the apologetics that have been defending the book of Daniel, and when it was recorded. And lo and behold, so many have said that the book of Daniel was recorded after the events of Jesus. However, when we use scientific methods, we use their tools for research, we use their tools for fact finding, and yet there's the book of Daniel in the great Qumran discovery, and it dates to 125 BC, that then through their conspiracy theorists completely out the window, and now the book of Daniel is very much uh, before Christ. And, and that's using their tools of uh, being able to scientifically date stuff. Absolutely. And you know, in the New Testament manuscripts too, uh, there's more and more scholarship, as you well know, giving an earlier and earlier dating for the Synoptic Gospels. I mean, even uh, great scholars like David Noel Friedman, for yes. example, now of blessed memory, uh, he's come out with an article saying that the Synoptics had to have been written before the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts had to have been written before Paul's death. Right. Uh, in 66 AD or something like sure. that. So, so really, the great fire of Rome is not mentioned, the fall of Jerusalem is not mentioned, and they would have mentioned those things. Now, Dr. Meyer, in just a few minutes, we're going to have an opportunity to handle, examine, touch and feel with our own eyes original Dead Sea Scroll material that we have back at the museum. Not a copy? Not a copy, the original thing. Oh, I can't wait. Well, Dr. Meyer, you didn't have to wait very long, and I just want to thank you for such an enjoyable time out there in the desert. But what I have here is an original biblical Dead Sea Scroll fragment from K4 at Qumran. And what I'm about to show you here, very few people outside of Jerusalem ever get the opportunity to hold, study, examine with their own eyes an original on sheepskin Biblical Dead Sea Scroll Fragment, that's from the book of Daniel. It dates to 125 B.C. Oh, fabulous. Now remember, Dr. Meyer, as we've taught already, the Dead Sea Scrolls weren't really scrolls. That's a misnomer because very few complete scrolls were actually found. The great discovery came in over 19,000 pieces that have taken literally 60 years to put back together again into the 800 or so scrolls that we know today. Now to help understand a little bit about the science and academia of this particular project, here in my hand is a fragment of a Torah scroll from the book of Leviticus. And as you can see, two columns, as you were mentioning before, yeah, yeah. stitched together. And if we were to be on the reconstruction process, and this is just 350 years old, sheepskin as well, as we were putting the scrolls back together again in Jerusalem, what we would have to do is find where that particular piece went in the text. What a puzzle it was. And right. we would yeah, literally yeah. Mm -hmm. put it back together again on where it was supposed to go. Now remember, Dr. Meyer, there were numerous copies of the exact same scroll. For instance, 36 copies of Psalms. So how were we able to put the scrolls back together again? Yeah. Three unique techniques have been the, the, the choices there. Handwriting style, very unique handwriting styles to some of the scribes. And because of infrared technology, we were able to line the piece up where it was supposed to go. Now, Dr. Meyer, here is an example of the technology that was used in Jerusalem in the reconstruction process. Here is how things look to the naked eye. However, when we switch things over to the infrared, look how clear that text becomes. Fascinating. But how, because of the duplicate copies, were we able to make sure that piece went into the right spot? Well, remember, just like humans, animals have unique DNA. Therefore, all we had to do to make sure the right spot, went, the right piece went into the right spot, we would then 
DNA test pieces to the north, west, east, and south, and if they all match the same DNA, we knew we put the scrolls back together again. Literally, what's taken over 60 years to perfect and to publish accurate data out of Jerusalem literally has taken that long for only one reason, making sure that we put the project back together again accurately. Remember, Dr. Meyer, we were talking out in the desert how any mistake we make gets scrutinized. They, the scientism, the humanism movement can make hundreds, if not thousands of mistakes, and they're justifiable. Christianity and Judaism, we make even the slightest mistake, we're literally yeah. obliterated by Absolutely the secular unfair. media. Absolutely unfair. It is unfair, but this is just a wonderful little piece, and again, a perfect representation of what the Dead Sea Scrolls truly were. 19,000 pieces put back together again into over 800 unique scrolls. It would really have been great if Moses and Isaiah, David and others had had their own blogs that told us when they wrote what they wrote. Well, we don't have that, but what we do have are references in the Old Testament to the gathering of books. The final book of the Old Testament canon, and canon, by the way, means a measuring stick, that which something is measured by. The final book was Malachi, written about 400 years before the birth of Christ. Those 400 years in between are called the intertestamental period. Now, during that time, God was silent in carrying men of old to write down his words. Now, that doesn't mean there wasn't any writing during this time. In fact, during this period, the books of the Apocrypha were written, books that are included in the Roman Catholic and some Protestant Bibles. We could not have a complete discussion of the Old Testament without examining its prophetic content that points to the Messiah. There were over 300 prophecies fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament has many that were made hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Precise, detailed prophecies such as where he would be born. Micah 5 verse 2 tells us that. How he would be born, according to Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. In fact, how he would die, Psalm 34 verse 20. And history has proven without any doubt whatsoever that they were fulfilled exactly as the writers of the Old Testament had prophesied hundreds of years earlier. In the book, Science Speaks, mathematician and scientist Peter Stoner applies the rules of probability to the prophecies. The chances of just eight of these 300 prophecies being fulfilled are one in 10 to the 17th power. That's one followed by, well, a number I can't even pronounce, triquintillion or something. In the book, Professor Stoner illustrates this as follows. He says, let's try to visualize this chance. Suppose that we take 10 to the 17th power, silver dollars worth that is, and lay them on the face of the state of Texas. They will cover the entire state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mess thoroughly. Then blindfold a man and tell him he must pick out that marked silver dollar. What chance would he have of getting the one with the mark on it? Just the same chance that the prophets would have of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man. Pretty amazing, wouldn't you say? But those odds are for only eight of the 300 prophecies. If you adjusted that figure to 48 being fulfilled, the odds are a staggering one in 10 to the 157th power. That would be one followed by 157 zeros. One of the, one of the most poignant um, sections is at Jesus' baptism when the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And what the voice from heaven has done is grab two chunks out of the Old Testament. This is my beloved son from Psalm 2, the, which probably was used at the coronation of a king and pointed to the ultimate king. And uh, in, 
in whom I am well pleased, from one of the servant songs in Isaiah that also pointed to the ultimate servant. And so in his baptism, in just that very simple phrase, every Hebrew would have known that. This comes from a royal psalm and a servant song. This is a king, but it's a servant king. Professors like me have spent an entire lifetime studying the Old Testament. What I hope we've accomplished is for you to understand the amazing involvement by God with this creation through his word. In the meantime, the next part of your study guide is going to examine some of the other prophecies about the Messiah.